the wild windy sea. I can hear her calling to me. So let's heave away, haul away, and fill our eyes with the shore. Calls to friends, ale and light, and a tale to brighten the night. So heave away, haul away, and heed the siren song. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Salty Siren. I'm your host, Three Dog slash David Bradbury, and I've got with me your other host, Jack McFarling. Dog, Ow. three dog. <laughs> three Do you dog? know who I'm talking about at all? No. Oh god damn it! Fallout Three. The the dude on the radio is three dog, oh. and he had like three total voice lines. And so, in between each song, there is a really good chance you were just gonna hear. It's me, your host, Three Dog, bringing it to you loud and proud. We're already so off track. <laughs> but, hello, dear listeners. Welcome back to the Salty Siren. We are going to be continuing the subathon and doing another story on submarines. So, Jack, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know the general premise for this one. Um, but you don't know any of the details. Would you like to inform our listeners? Yeah, I'll give you the teaser trailer for this episode. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is about how a sub in World War II sank one singular ship and in doing so shot to the very top of the sub tonnage leaderboard in a matter of minutes you got it uh in particular we are going to be covering the story of the archer fish and honestly the I don't know if you would say it's more remarkable, but the ship that the archer fish sank. Archer Title fish card. are so cool. They are <laughs> so cool. They're like, what a cool animal. But, title card, the sinking of Shinano. So, this will actually require us giving some background on uh, the war in the Pacific in World War II. And a little bit about Japan as a nation before then. So, how how much do you know about the Russo-Japanese War, Jack? I know it was very short and very one-sided. And uh, Japan, because of it, got a seat at the table after the end of World War I. Pretty much. Um, Japan won against Russia when basically no one thought they were going to. And the sort of key event in the Russo-Japanese War was the Battle of Tsushima. That was uh, a battle in between the mainland of Japan and uh, the Korean Peninsula where basically Russia's entire navy had traveled halfway across the globe, showed up, and just got their ass absolutely beat by the Japanese navy. Uh, you know, Some people were going on record saying it was the biggest naval event since Trafalgar. Um, generally just singing the praises of Japan because... It suddenly catapulted Japan to the forefront of people's minds as a modern nation. They were no longer that weird place that we'd found that was still in the medieval times. Like, they were now caught up and contending with 
major nations on the world stage. This was also, coincidentally, the last uh, naval battle where the ships of the line style tactics were used. Oh, cool. Um, so, basically just Russian battleships and Japanese battleships lining up and shooting at each other until one side gave up. <laughs> um, the good old days. But this victory at the Battle of Tsushima kind of made Japan cocky. They really just thought that, oh, well, if we can beat the Russians' ass, like, we can take on basically anyone. It also cemented the idea that their navy was going to be the key to their power as an island nation. So they just got the fuck on the whole, like, dreadnought and warship producing game in between the world wars. But uh, as World War II drew near and Japan's imperial ambitions meant that they wanted to conquer the lands surrounding them, including the then U.S.-controlled... Uh, Good lord, blanking on fucking words. The U.S.-controlled Philippines, thank you. Um, they knew that they were going to piss America off. And they knew that America wouldn't take it lying down. And so they started to plan specifically about how to defeat the Americans. The massive production of ships was partially because by their calculations Japan could never hope to match America's industrial abilities so they needed to sort of build up a surplus before they could do what they wanted to do and take the Philippines uh, they also had this core belief that since Tsushima had been such a big deal in the Russo-Japanese War that the proper way to win major wars was by claiming overwhelming victory in a single decisive battle. This was kind of an idea being tossed around in various naval scholarly circles, I guess. Uh, at the naval equivalent of West Point, that sort of thing. And it was known as Decisive Battle Doctrine, or as the Japanese called it, Kantai Kesen. This also placed overwhelming importance on the big guns. Again, Japan was like, well, our battleships won us Tsushima, they'll win us anything else. And at the time, that was kind of a prevailing idea is that the battleships were the linchpin, the centerpiece of any navy, and navies kind of needed to just operate around the battleship. But uh, Kantai Kesen took this even more to heart, and so Japanese vessels going into World War II were designed around this idea of the super battleship, where Anything that wasn't a battleship basically existed to support the battleship. Which, that, I mean... Oh, go ahead. This whole um, decisive battle doctrine, uh, it does kind of make sense to me. Because war is so much a, a, a battle of perception and public support. And definitely, like... I'm thinking about Horatio Nelson's smackdown. Um, <laughs> you know, Napoleon, you know, might as well have called it quits after that. Right. I mean, that was, like, they're not wrong. Like, winning one major battle is going to be the difference between winning a war and losing a war. Yeah. Yeah. They're 
you begin to see some cracks in the logic though but we'll we'll get into that in just a bit right now i'm thinking about midway yep we're we're heading that direction yeah so the japanese navy very much centered around this idea of the super battleship that the battleships were the most important part and they with this kantai kessen in mind had the idea of how they were going to capture the philippines and what they were going to do about America after that happened. The idea was to take the Philippines and then kind of just sit on it. This would force the U.S. to chase after, so to speak, the Philippines and cross the entire Pacific to get to the fighting and reclaim it. In a way, this is kind of smart, because they were hoping that that would extend U.S. supply lines to their breaking point, and together with their plans of fortifying really small islands along the way, they hoped that they could make it enough of a pain in the ass for America to get to the Philippines that the American public would kind of just say it's not worth it and give up. And then Japan would have control over the Philippines and would remain pretty much uncontested in Asia. Yeah, makes sense. The problems started to creep in, at least from an outsider's perspective, with... um, their plans to defeat the U.S. soundly and basically just rule over the Pacific. Their idea was to create a superior speed and superior range in their battleships so that uh, they could have an advantage And then they would deal a preemptive strike, hopefully reducing the U.S. to 70% of its naval operation in the Pacific. At this point, they felt that they would be roughly on par in terms of naval size, and with superior Japanese training, superior Japanese troop accuracy, and superior speed and superior range, they couldn't lose. But if you're aware of something called the law of averages, <laughs> you may see a bit of flawed logic in that. No matter how good you think your troops training is, <laughs> do you think the Americans are just fucking around and like their troops don't have any idea what they're doing? And, like, as accurate as your troop is, are they really going to be so much more accurate than an American that it's going to make a difference? And with superior speed and superior range, sure, but you're also counting on knocking the U.S. down, like, the U.S. fleet down by 30% in order to pull this off. It's a tall order. Uh, it's, it's certainly a tall order, but also in that preemptive strike, you see the beginnings of Pearl Harbor. So at this point, Yamamoto enters the game. Really, really important naval dude in World War II for the Japanese. And he took one look at the plan and said, All right. So your idea is reduce them by 30% and then we can win a protracted war. And the Japanese naval command was like, yeah, that's the plan. He was like, that's fucking stupid. (laughs) (laughs) He was like, if you knock them down by 30%, America's industrial capacity is so much greater than ours that we will stand no chance if shit goes long. 
Like, basically, we need to win this from the second it starts, or we have no hope. And so he advocated for, instead of the previous plan of kind of taking the Philippines and then whittling down slash preemptively striking the U.S. to damage their fleet, he said, we've got to just take out the whole thing at once. And so Pearl Harbor kind of became this much, much bigger version of the preemptive strike idea that had existed for some time. Basically, uh, just hope and pray to God that the Pearl Harbor attack devastates the U.S. fleet so badly that they just give up. And if they don't give up, get them close to giving up, because we've fortified so many tiny little islands that will drag the war out, and before their industrial capacity will give up, public support will give up. But unfortunately, Again, Pearl Harbor didn't go exactly the way they wanted it to go. It did not. But I thought this was kind of funny. I, I never heard this before. But when Yamamoto pitched Pearl Harbor to the Japanese Naval Command, they were like, fuck no, absolutely not. Uh, mainly because they did not want to put such a large portion of the Japanese fleet that far out in the Pacific, unprotected. Like, it was kind of ballsy. That was a risky um, move, yeah. But uh, Yamamoto basically said, if you don't approve my plan, I quit. And the Japanese naval command was like, ah, fuck, we need this guy. All right, it's approved. <laughs> like, I don't know, just him being like, if you don't approve my plan, I'm out of here. And they're like, no, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah. But, as we know, and as you pointed out, shit didn't go according to plan. They actually came away from Pearl Harbor thinking that they were relatively successful. Yamamoto is famously quoted as saying, gentlemen, I fear we have awoken a sleeping giant or something to that effect. I don't have the quote in front of me. But Japanese Naval Command saw the numbers, saw the battleships that had been sunk, the damage that had been done and said okay yeah that's a win they thought that they had at least done enough damage that they had crippled the u.s ability to mount a counteroffensive. um the main thing that they were really surprised by was the fact that uh pearl harbor just pissed the u.s off <laughs> it didn't like make them want to quit <laughs> Uh, but on the point of, like, not being able to mount a counterattack, to an extent, they were kind of right. Um, the U.S. really struggled to put up that much of a fight until 1942. Uh, but in that time, the Japanese had also gotten pretty confident again. 1941 had seen the completion of the Japanese super battleship Yamato, uh, which, unlike the U.S. fleet, which all had to be designed around the idea that it had to fit through the Panama Canal, <laughs> uh, Japan had no such restrictions, and so Yamato was an absolute behemoth and is still the largest battleship ever produced. She was really just the pride of Japan, and as was the case for most things called the pride of Japan, did absolutely jack shit the whole <laughs> war. Um, yeah. We've mentioned the un the co amazingly unremarkable story of the Yamato. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it really didn't do too much. This was partially because. 
it was so fucking big that it guzzled fuel like nothing else. So it needed to refuel fairly often. And they were so terrified of losing it that they kept on sailing it out to some place, kind of arriving a bit late because it sailed all the way from the mainland. And then, once the battle didn't go that well, they'd say, fuck, we need to refuel, but we don't want to risk refueling at a less safe, closer by port, and they would go all the back, all the way back to the mainland. And pretty much rinse and repeat until it was sunk. <laughs> yep. But, um, another reason that Yamato really didn't do too much was that the Japanese kind of realized, like, hey, we spent all this fucking money and all this time and all these resources on these super battleships, but it was pretty clear, even by 1941, that the aircraft carrier was much more important and so, come 1942, the Japanese completed Musashi, uh, the much less famous, but second in the Yamato-class line of super battleships. Uh, keeping with tradition, Musashi also did jack actual shit the entire war. <laughs> uh, but 1942 was really... Uh, the year of checking oneself for Japan. They'd taken the Philippines and pretty much the whole of, like, the island nations of Asia without really any pushback. Or at least pushback that was so easy, they thought, like, man, we're just the best at this shit. And so they went to try and conquer Australia. This did not go well for them, <laughs> partially because uh, Australia is kind of a much harder to fight and conquer place than just a bunch of small Pacific islands, but also because the U.S. really started stepping up at this point. Uh, Around the time that Australia really wasn't going well, the U.S. also undertook what is known as the Doolittle Raid, where they were able to successfully bomb Tokyo. So, three full years before the end of the war, your capital's getting bombed. And they, uh, on the scale of everything else um a pretty small scale effect but morale wise it was an effective move definitely the japanese public suddenly was like oh shit like we're kind of in danger at this point things aren't maybe going as well as we're being told and it uh, really was a kind of an indicator because later that year, Japan bungled its uh, single decisive battle that it had been preparing for in Midway. And they, they bungled it harder than one of the biggest bungles in history. <laughs> like seriously it just oh i mean we'll we'll do a whole midway series at some point but um yeah midway was not good for the japanese they lost pretty much all of their major carriers and the nation of japan collectively shat its pants <laughs> coincidentally the third ship in the Yamato class line was partially completed in the dry docks. And with the new uh, terrifying realization that most of their Navy's fighting power had just been taken out, the ship was scrapped. 
Or was it? Hmm. Enter Shinano. A result of the Japanese panicking after the loss of all the aircraft carriers in Midway, Shinano was pivoted while in the dry dock from another Yamato-class super battleship into the largest aircraft carrier ever built at the time. Uh, the pivot in planning meant a major redesign of her hull, internal compartments, and pretty much all major systems. Uh, and as a result, the initial scheduled completion was 1945. Oh, and we should clarify, in, if you don't know, um, in Midway, Jap Japan lost all four of its aircraft carriers yeah so that yeah just so you know it it was pretty rough so they decided okay fuck this we need not super battleships but a super carrier and shinano was shinano was born she was supposed to carry 170 planes 47 of which she was able to equip and run on her own with 120 kept below decks as replacements or not necessarily all below decks but you get what i mean 120 meant as replacements for itself other carriers in its group and shore air bases uh all was pretty much a going according to plan in terms of construction until 1944 where Japan really started to get desperate. At this point they were pretty much losing every engagement they had in a naval sense and it had, it had kind of been the trend post, uh, post Midway. And although they were definitely dealing some back, they were still losing nonetheless. The Japanese were desperate for something to turn the tides, and so Shinano's completion date was moved up to November of 1944. As tends to happen when management suddenly declares a project that was due in a year is suddenly due tomorrow, <laughs> Shinano suffered majorly as a result. The uh, ship was really not fit for sea in a military sense come November. Like, you know, she held water and could run under her, her own propulsion, but... Uh, Japan was really, really getting anxious because the U.S. was now close enough that they were launching spy planes to survey potential bombing targets. Japanese Naval Command was paranoid that Shinano's dummy thick cheeks would be <laughs> spotted from the air and that it would just get bombed into smithereens and all of this would have been for nothing. So on November 28th, 1944, Shinano was due to leave the Yokosuka shipyards and head for Kure, a port located in the uh, inland sea of Japan. She had been assigned a captain, Toshio Abe, and he basically got on board and said, Hold up, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because looking around, who boy, Shinano was not even close to done. What a piece of junk. <laughs> of her 12 boilers she was supposed to have, eight were operational, with the remaining four being in various stages of construction. Uh, no testing had been done on watertight seals or bulkhead to bulkhead airtight <laughs> qualities. And he pretty much was like, I beg you, at least let us do basic safety testing on this thing. And Japanese Naval Command promptly told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> and they left on the 28th 
as planned with a three Kagero class destroyer escort. But I can't emphasize this enough. Shinano took most of her construction crew with her. She was literally being built as she <laughs> sailed. <laughs> like, just why? Why? <laughs> it's, a, it's a new, it's a new era in shipbuilding. We're we're taking it, taking it mobile. Oh, it just they were visionaries. It just they people couldn't understand them at the time. <laughs> but uh, Toshio also pointed out, he's like, "Hey, you guys are concerned about how dummy large we are." Can we get, like, an air escort? Because if planes show up at any point, we're totally fucked. And Japanese Naval Command said, Sure, of course, just kidding, go fuck yourself. (laughs) So, uh, as a result, Toshio and Shinano departed at night in hopes of completing the voyage before full daybreak. This was ambitious, especially considering that only having a third or two thirds boiler power meant a max speed of twenty knots. Cooking. So she was really trundling along. But uh, leaving port, good old uh, Shinano and our boy Abe decided that they needed to move in kind of a zigzag pattern to do their best to avoid any sort of vessels, planes, what have you. Enter the archer fish. Under the command of a Captain Joseph Enright, the archer fish was... Another one of the Balao class submarine that we've discussed on previous episodes. And it was uh, Enright's first war patrol on the sub. I hope most of the kinks were worked out on this Blau class. Honestly, I, I wasn't able to find a lot about Archer Fish's unique qualities because this was kind of the only thing Archer Fish did. It, I guess, just wasn't that noteworthy. I, I'm sure it's probably sitting in an official record somewhere, but not that I could find doing my research. But, uh,. Enright had a reputation for being, I wouldn't say a scaredy cat, but (laughs) overly cautious. Mm. Uh, To the point where he was viewed as being somewhat fearful of command. In in fact, he'd, he'd actually requested to be relieved of his last posting of command as he had completely lost faith in his own abilities. Damn. I'm, which, you know, is like, is kind of sad. But, like, also, I, I empathize a bit. You no, know? I get that. Like, all of the dudes on that ship are like, their lives are literally in your hands. And so, I, I would be stressed the fuck out. <laughs> having any sort of military command so yeah, especially I, I in it. a uh, in a janky pressurized tube that shoots high explosives that have a yes. potential to loop back around and hit you <laughs> I know. oh man no i i completely get uh where he was coming from with that but uh, he was determined, after being appointed as the captain of the Archerfish, to prove himself. He was kind of given a second chance, and he said, like, I'm not going to fuck this one up. We're going to do something, and I'm going to keep my men safe. At 2140, so for all 
American slash non-military time people. That is 9.40 p.m. The Archerfish picked up a fat contact <laughs> on the radar. It blinded the, and, the sonar operator. <laughs> pretty much. But the hilarious part about this... Uh, the, my fucking notes here. Before long, they heard the steady clapping of Shannon's <laughs> cheeks on the horizon. But seriously, Shinano was so fucking big that they got visual just after it entered radar contact. Damn. Like, you could see it from that far away. <laughs> but uh, at this point, Enright's anime protagonist theme started playing and he vowed to redeem himself by claiming this prize uh the dude turned on the archer fish's sonar and just straight up kept it on for for reference i i think we've maybe covered this in the past but sonar is loud as fuck <laughs> to any ships in range to be detected by it. So, as long as it keeps going boom, boom, at regular intervals, Shinano and her escorts could basically trace that signal and find where the submarine was. Enright was aware of this, but just did not care. He was absolutely certain that or he was dead set on trying to catch any evasive maneuvers that this huge contact made and he did his best to move into attack position trying to anticipate the movements meanwhile aboard the shinano our boy Abe was rolling up a fat one and really just not giving a shit that there was a submarine detected nearby. But in, in all seriousness, despite kind of not really caring, Shinano knew by this point in the war that U.S. submarines operated in packs. The way he saw it, no one would be dumb enough to just leave their sonar on for that long, so it had to be a trap. Mm. Sonar was being left on so that the escorts would pull away to hunt down the submarine, which would open up the Shinano to just getting absolutely railed by the other submarines in the pack. He was so sure of this that one of the escorts started to break off and Toshio ordered it back into formation. So they like started going after him and very well could have found and attacked the archer fish. But Toshio Abe said no. Do you think that's what the the captain of the archer fish was anticipating? I I don't think so. I think that from what I read, what he was trying to do was he was sure that the large contact, the Shinano, was going to detect the radar or the sonar pulses and begin evasive maneuvers. So he was keeping it on, expecting that just the presence of the sonar pulses would cause the Shinano to turn. And he needed the sonar on to tell which way it was turning. And be able to accurately hunt after it. For the sake of the but, story, I like to think that he was four par parallel universes ahead of the uh, <laughs> Shinano. I mean, if we're going with, like, anime protagonist, and I, <laughs> then, yeah, he's like gigabraining this. Yeah. But, um, wanting to further throw off any possible wolf pack shenanigans going on, uh, Toshio threw the carrier on a southeasternly course 
and slammed it into full gear, which uh, the one bit about the archer fish is that her max speed was 19 knots. So even at 66% of her normal engine power, the Shinano outpaced the archer fish by one knot. So before too long, despite pushing the archer fish to its absolute limits, Shinano dropped off of the radar. Oh. Pissed as hell that he possibly lost the ship and gave up another opportunity at redeeming himself, uh, Enright elected to keep heading kind of a southwest direction to the southeast course the Shinano had taken. He hoped that the carrier was simply taking an evasive maneuver and wasn't heading towards its destination. He was effectively hoping that by continuing to go southwest, eventually, the carrier would be convinced that the sub was gone, would turn back onto its original course, and would head in his direction. On the Shinano, Abe was convinced that they'd lost him and did indeed turn back west. Hey, uh, just, just in time for the strain of the turn to cause one of Shinano's engines to shit the bed. <laughs> uh, this brought her absolute top speed down to 18 knots. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, the propeller was on the other boat to oh, the, use the, the, a boating the, version of the shoe. <laughs> now the turntables. Now the turntables. It wasn't too long before the archerfish regained contact and swung into an advantageous position for an attack. Keep in mind, Archerfish had no fucking clue what Shinano was. Uh, they knew it was an aircraft carrier, but they didn't know what ship it was, where it was headed, or what their plans were. So any sort of heading that the Archerfish took up was Enright hazarding a guess of maybe they'll be in firing position? by the time that, like, we meet up. But he honestly just had no idea where Shinano was going, what was it taking evasive maneuvers, and what was it turning towards its actual destination. Where just... did it come from? Where is it going? Where did it come from? <laughs> Cotton eye Joe. <laughs> but, uh... This carried on for, for quite a bit, with the archer fish being not quite fast enough to pull ahead and loop around for an advantageous attack. So Enright's like, God fucking damn it, like we find this thing again and we still can't get into a position where we can really shoot at it. So again, pissed, he hops on the horn and frustratedly radios the carrier's position to U.S. Fleet Command. Back on the Shinano, Toshio, who was listening in, was freaked out and was convinced that the radio transmission was uh, some sort of coordination message from Archerfish as the leader of a wolf pack to the other subs in the wolf pack. They, it wasn't super clear on whether they were listening in but just couldn't understand them, or it was encoded, or if they could just tell that there were radio transmissions being sent. But regardless, Toshio became convinced that this radio transmission was a signal for the wolf pack to attack. He reasoned that any wolf pack would be hanging out closer to the mainland, trying to pick off kind of the remnants of Japan's navy as it went in and out of port, and so he swerved further out to sea. 
to uh, the archerfish slash Enright, his prayers had been answered hmm. as the enormous flank stake <laughs> of the fucking Shinano turned and presented itself for roasting. In non-bullshit terms, Shinano turned in such a way that her broadside lined directly up with Archerfish's forward torpedo tubes. And it basically said, please, fuck me up real good. I'm <laughs> begging you. <laughs> Archerfish slash Enright sees this and is like, what the fuck are they doing? We'll take it. And they submerged. When the sub went underwater, that cut off all radio transmissions. And Abe took this as further signal that an attack was imminent. And he pulled into an even better shooting position for the archer fish. Okay. It was such a good angle. Enright realized that the archerfish was actually on a collision course with one of Shinano's escorts. They were submerged, but he wasn't sure if they were submerged enough that they weren't going to slam into this ship. But he said, fuck it, we can't lose this attack. And so they pushed forward and passed under one of the support supporting vessels for Shinano. No idea that the sub was now inside the net. With oh one last look through the periscope, Enright gave the order to fire and lobbed six forward torpedoes at the starboard side of Shinano. With basically no distance to travel besides the minimum arming distance, four of the six found their mark and rocked the Titanic vessel. Even with such a powerful barrage, four should not have been enough to sink a vessel as large as Shinano. After all, she was a Titan, built from the same stock as the... Yamato and the Musashi, the super battleships that were invincible, definitely. <laughs> just, just don't look in the direction of Okinawa. <laughs> <laughs> but Mikami Kaigun Taisa, the executive officer of the Shinano, quickly took control of all damage control efforts. And radioing down to the lower decks, he quickly realized that four was, in fact, enough. <laughs> that was plenty. <laughs> Three of the torpedoes had effectively critically hit. Um, they hit the section known as the Citadel. I honestly can't remember if I've explained this in previous episodes, but... The Citadel is effectively a portion of the ship that is... They attempt to keep it as far below the waterline as possible, or as much of it below the waterline as possible. It's armored more than the other parts of the ship, because it contains all the good bits. Such as boiler rooms, engines, fuel tanks, and explosive storage. Three of those torpedoes had punched right into the citadel. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so things were not going well. Steam, steam turbine room three had pretty much just heard a faint skimmy de bop and dada before <laughs> it was just immediately obliterated. And it was just flooded completely as it was blown wide open. Boiler Room 3, the starboard, the starboard oil tank, and the air compressor room were also immediately fucked, and the starboard gas tanks and surrounding chambers weren't immediately fucked, but were fucked in, like, 
a few minutes <laughs> in due time it, in due time this was made infinitely worse by the fact that Shinano was a shit show and really really wasn't ready good old Abe was also making it worse by panicking and still holding the command of full steam ahead slam at that motherfucking throttle button <laughs> trying to get them the hell out of dodge like i i understand his reasoning and i don't necessarily think that it was panic but that meant that the drag of the gaping wounds below the waterline were filled with water with the full pressure <laughs> of the ship steaming ahead at 18 knots. So pretty immediately, rivets went flying, bulkheads just straight up gave up, and turns out all of that testing for is this chamber watertight is pretty important because <laughs> most of them weren't. As it got worse, the speed slowed, the ship began listing heavily to starboard, and two of her additional boiler rooms were flooded due to bulkhead failures and lack of watertight sealing, and they were just outright killed. Pretty much immediately, they were like, we've got to counter flood this bitch, and they started pumping as much water as they could into the ballasts and extraneous rooms on the port side of the ship, trying to just weigh it down on that side enough that they could do something about all the water they were taking on from their starboard side. However, after a bit of counter-flooding, the list kind of evened out a little bit, and command was like, all right, that did it. <laughs> We're safe. We did it, Pat. We saved the shim, uh, Shinano. <laughs> However, water was continuing to flood into different parts of the ship down below. And it wasn't too long before... They said, hey, why are we starting to list again? And they said, because we flooded everything we can on the port <laughs> side. <laughs> I have been flooding bulkheads for three days. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. They had just counter flooded everything. And although they were starting to purposefully flood some of the compartments on the internal side of the ship, the list got so bad that the intake ports were lifted out of the water and so they couldn't take any more water onto the port side of the ship. But with this, more and more water kept flooding in on the starboard side and good old Abe couldn't bring himself to order the abandoned ship and instead radioed across the vessel saying you are officially relieved of command or you are officially relieved of duty save yourselves on a much more serious and somber note 1455 of the 2515 aboard Shinano died in her sinking including Toshino Abe and most of the officer class. Jesus. The Archerfish returned to US controlled Guam where it the reports of its sinkage basically just weren't believed. <laughs> Yeah, they're just like yeah bullshit until what do you Japanese... mean there's a Yamato size cla a Yamato size aircraft carrier yeah like this had been such a top secret Japanese project 
But they they were all like, there's no way that you sunk something that big. Bullshit. But then, Japanese radio traffic confirmed it. Enright and the Archerfish were credited with a conservative estimate of the tonnage of the ship for 59,000 tons. By sinking a single vessel, Enright and the Archerfish ended World War II at the top of the U.S. submarine tonnage list. And that's with the 59,000 figure. A lot of estimates I was reading said that the real weight was more likely closer to 72,000. Dear Lord. Which, honestly, I wonder if some amount of it was submarine dick measuring <laughs> that they were just because like the the dudes who came in second place were like 50 something thousand and had sank five vessels and so i wonder if they weren't like oh man we've got this in the bag and then archerfish is like yeah we sunk one thing uh 70, tons yeah and just to, like, keep the rest of the submarine command from being pissed that they were outdone by so much by only one vessel, they were like, yeah, it was 59,000. You know, you guys were close. <laughs> they got their consolation prize. Yeah, definitely. But uh, Archerfish, to this day still is credited with the largest ship ever sunk by a submarine. And there you go. That's the story of the Shinano, its cheeks, the Archerfish, <laughs> and The destruction of said them. cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. The, 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 I, the clapping of, of said cheeks. I just, I thought it was fascinating that they had just oh one more note that i did have here understandably when news got back to japan that the shinano had gone down uh japanese naval command really didn't like that news <laughs> so of the remainder of the crew that had been rescued, they were taken to their destination on the inland sea in Japan and were basically held prisoner there throughout the entire war. Oh. So that they could not talk about the fact that the Shinano had been sunk. Yeah. Japan continued pretending that the Shinano was definitely out there and was for sure fighting back against the americans don't worry just please no one go diving off the shores but um these poor also, japanese carriers just can't get a break i i know but they also were so pissed they appointed like they they basically appointed a special investigation to figure out who was at fault for the sinking of the Shinano. And the investigation came back and basically said, so many people made so many horrible decisions <laughs> that there's really no point in assigning blame. Because, honestly, it wouldn't reflect that well on Japanese naval command. And they were like, yeah, okay, fair, no one's fault but we're still going to imprison the crew. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah. Shinano. The whole story. The very... The whole brief, brief story. <laughs> story. Of it leaving port and being sunk a few hours later. Ah. Uh. 
I honestly wonder what would have happened if it would have survived. If it would have actually made a difference or not. Or if it would have just suffered the same fate as Musashi and Yamato and been a gas-guzzling behemoth that they were too terrified to actually put in any real danger. Yeah, I mean, if they had taken a little more time to complete it and... I don't know. They were getting desperate at that point. Um, but there's only so much that one carrier can do. Right. So I mean, that's that's the thing. It's just like it it was pretty much over. Like decisive battle doctrine. Yeah. Midway happened, and it that was that was kind of it. But yeah, with that, uh, do we want to go into the other shit we've been doing in our lives? Or were you wanting to discuss Shinano's cheeks for a bit longer? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's just insane, um. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder what would happen if they stayed the course in creating another super battleship. Yeah, I kind of wondered that too, but I, I bet that it probably would have just suffered the same fate as Yamato and Musashi. Yeah, I don't know. It's. They were kind of dumb. <laughs> like, I I get that, you know, pretty much every, like, nation that gets really, really full of itself. Looking at you, Gerald Ford class super carrier. Yeah. But uh, every nation that gets looking really full of itself. Looking at you, F-35 Lightning. <laughs> yeah. But they they just get the idea of, like, we're going to create this super something that's going to be better than all the other somethings. But they just end up creating a massively expensive, gigantic target. Like, Yamato and Musashi were supposed to be this, like, the greatest battleships ever built. And they they, they didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah like they were just useless you had spent so much money on the steel and the training and the fuel and like all of that and so much time too yeah it's, ki it was... it's it's kind of like uh one level removed from all of germany's uh, you know, silly super weapon programs. A little less out there, but um, yeah. I mean, I'd say it's the same line of thinking as the mouse. Have you ever heard anything about that? We've we've discussed the mouse. Yeah, but just the same thing. That's like we're gonna create the heaviest, biggest, baddest tank slash warship that has ever existed. What do you mean it's slow as fuck? <laughs> what do you mean it guzzles gas? What do you mean it just got bombed from the air? You know what would make these nachos better? More cheese. <laughs> yeah, more. 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 <laughs> just dumping the whole bag. Yeah. No, it just... I don't know. I, I wonder if they wouldn't have been better served just creating multiple smaller not super battleships. Yeah. Like, I don't know what the investment was, but eh. So, yeah. With that on to the uh, the ending bit. We, we need to come up with a name for this. We keep on just 
saying like want to talk about our lives we can call it the friend zone the friend zone <laughs> yeah fuck it sure all right let's see if we remember this by next time dear listeners <laughs> <laughs> help so, us out on, on to the friend zone then jack what's been going on with you what's something you've been doing slash enjoying lately i went to therapy for the first time today hey let's go mental health yeah it was good not that anything is going super wrong right now but um it's good good to talk and i it was a good session yeah i'm glad i don't know my my experiences with therapy have not been super wonderful but i'm always happy if it helps someone else you know and i do i do want to give it another shot at some point but yeah i mean it's it's uh, like anything i you know finding the right therapist the right person for you right well and god damn the american healthcare system uh yeah I like the card that my I'm sure people out there relate and I'm sure someone's gonna tell me that I'm wrong and they sent me a card that had the info on it I'm telling you they didn't they sent me like an insurance card but it doesn't have like the group number or like any other information it has the member ID but yeah, nothing the, else yeah that's the other stuff is pretty important it is indeed and so it works like it you know when i've been like hey pharmacy here's my here's my insurance hey doctor here's my insurance they're able to run it off of that but when i want to look up like hey what's a therapist near me that my insurance will help out with the website is like, yeah, give us uh, give us the group number. Give us your bin. And I'm like, I'll fucking have those. And it's yeah. like, okay, just enter your like identifying information. And I do that, and it's like, we couldn't identify you with that. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> so I, I fucking, I called them like months ago. I was like, hey, you guys didn't send me a card with the shit on it. And they were like oh okay we'll send you a card with the shit on it i was <laughs> like thank you because i of course american health insurance i'd been on the phone on hold for like two hours but uh yeah i just i still haven't gotten anything well okay so, <laughs> it's you know it's been a few months at this point but ugh. but Sorry for, for hijacking there. <laughs> I, I am very glad that therapy went well. Other than therapy, you got any like games you're playing, shit you're working on with the house? Um, I'm uh, going to scrape and paint tomorrow. Or not tomorrow, Saturday. So hey. break out nice. the old ladder and go to town. I, I would say hell yeah, but I hate house maintenance. <laughs> so, yeah, I know it's necessary, but like, uh, painting for me is very, very stressful. Oh really? Yeah, I don't know. It just like I'm constantly like worried I'm gonna like drip paint on like the one spot that I don't have covered by the tarp, you know? Yeah. Or. Well well, thankfully else. this thankfully this is outside so oh yeah but just fuck it up you know <laughs> painting's yeah. fun if you're like not super concerned about where the paint's going but uh no that'll, that'll be good too yeah well, what's going on with you besides rogue health insurance cards <laughs> Uh, not a whole lot. Oh, actually, a, a little bit. Where is he? Where's the boy? Ollie. Any 
anyway, uh, Oliver got, uh, which for reference, dear listeners, Oliver is my my eldest child, my cat. The eldest <laughs> and the largest. The eldest, the largest. The stinkiest. And now, <laughs> the smelliest. And now, the toothlessest. Oh, damn. He got all his teeth out. And because Oliver is an endless pit of health problems and money, uh, he he has, or at some point, they like put him under for something, and they said that he had a heart murmur, and they haven't been able to detect it since. But because of that, he's got to get on the the special boy anesthesia, which means that he is high as a fucking kite for like <laughs> four whole days after the surgery. <laughs> so like literally all of today, he was just laying next to me as I was working. And I think he got up like two times but was just like slugging out like <laughs> completely just like arms limp and like anytime I'd reach over and scratch him he'd immediately just roll onto his back and start like writhing around on the ground <laughs> <laughs> not like freaking out or anything but just like oh hell yeah scratches out so fucking high <laughs> like <laughs> Oh, that poor bastard. I know, but hopefully this is a new beginning, because it's his teeth and his mouth that give him the most trouble. So, without yeah. any teeth, you know, like, how, how are your teeth going to bother you? He did get to keep the fangs, so he still got a few chompers. But pretty much everything else is gone. Here's to Ollie. To Ollie. The other cats also, uh, w whilst he's high, uh, will just hiss at him anytime he gets close. It's like <laughs> they don't recognize him as Oliver. Oh yeah, sure. Which I I don't know. Maybe it's also because like his pupils are just like permanently dilated while yeah. he's on this stuff, <laughs> like. So maybe they think he's, like, about to freak out on him or something. But oh, yeah. Pounce on him. Yeah. He just, like, waddles at, like, full tilt down hallways and then will just, like, collapse and not move <laughs> for hours at a time with his pupils just super dilated. Yeah, so I mean, I, th he's... I think if your roommate was, you know, high on LSD... You might be a little wary of them too. Oh, definitely. But I just feel bad because he's like, he's having such a good time, you know? <laughs> like, he's getting soft food and like, scritches feel extra nice. But the other two cats will like hiss at him slash hit him if he gets close. Oh, poor guy. But that's been the main thing. That and uh, playing some Hi-Fi Rush and Darkest Dungeon 2, which are polar opposites. <laughs> Almost about as different as they can get. For, for reference, dear listeners, Hi-Fi Rush is a rhythm-based rhythm beat-em-up that's like in a super like colorful comic book art style is like really funny and upbeat and then darkest dungeon is suffering tm <laughs> <laughs> also kind of a comic book art style but uh very Gordon very dark. dark eldritch horrors the world is literally ending um and you are fighting back against abominations in a desperate attempt to make the end of the world just a, just a little bit less worse <laughs> but yeah been having fun with those been having fun hanging out with the cat and that pretty much does it 
Well, I'd like to thank Joe Koziak for mixing and mastering the intro and outro music. And to Colin Drown at Colin underscore Drawn for our beautiful artwork. Side note, Colin just got married. So congratulations, Colin. Very happy for you, my dude, if you ever listen to these. (laughs) Yeah, patrons, uh, you owe Colin money because he just got married. You can't see it because this is a podcast, but I'm holding you at gunpoint. (laughs) Pay him. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, dear listeners, uh, folks, whoever who tuned in. This has been The Salty Siren, and we'll see you next time for maybe Subathon, maybe not. Who knows? Bon voyage. Auf Wiedersehen. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, call and hear the ancient song of sailors long forgone and sailors still to be. A sweet and solemn tune spoke gently by the tide. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, fall, join the song.